We didn't tell her the truth. This man died for no reason at all. They let it go. They let him die. But he knew somebody was going to get him. So it's scary, sure. There's no uh, code of ethics out there. I want to find the man who murdered your dad. I've never really felt right about that. This is pretty raw shit that I really don't really want to even talk about. I really don't know how I want to tell you. I just need to tell you the truth. Don't trust anybody, not even family. Welcome to West Virginia. They are some sick ass people. We're gonna find out. I know we are. Ice Cold Case, available wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic today, Tim. A lot of it has to do with the fact that we are continuing our conversations with people that we've met for the first time thanks to CrimeCon. I feel like this is post-CrimeCon season where we bring on these people who have a podcast or have a story or have a cold case that they're advocating for in this particular one. This conversation coming up, we have someone who is personally deeply affected by a family member's murder and she decided that this medium of podcasting was the best way to get the story out there maybe get some answers absolutely and we we don't have to give too much background here in the intro because i feel like uh the conversation with our guest madison mcgee of ice cold case her father john cornelius mcgee was murdered on july 11th 2002 in belmont county ohio and madison is doing her own podcast she's advocating for the case and we met her at crime con and as you listen to her speak about this, it goes beyond the podcast. It really becomes a personal story. And she does talk a lot about how it's affected her on a stress level and a number of other ways. So this isn't just about producing a podcast about a family member. It's about the entirety of what happens when a tragedy like this strikes someone's family. Absolutely. And you can check out Ice Cold Case on your favorite podcatcher, or you can go to icecoldcase.com and learn everything that's on the website there about Madison's father and about the investigation. And Tim, if people wanted to hear this, of course, some people out there want to hear this without the ads, without those breaks, where would they go to find this episode plus everything else? Crawl Space Media has produced without commercials. Well, our listeners can find Missing Premium on Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe there. But if you're not an Apple user, you can go to missing.supportingcast.fm. You get ad-free episodes, early releases, and our weekly bonus show that everybody loves. All right. And we are going to break real quick for a commercial, and we'll be back with Madison McGee. Welcome to the podcast, Madison McGee. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? We're doing great. It's great to see you again. We yeah. met at CrimeCon, and before we started recording, we were just saying some stuff about CrimeCon, how it feels when you're there. We met on the first night and then didn't see each other after that, even though we were in the same room uh, for the most part all weekend. What was your uh, take on, on CrimeCon? Before we get into this conversation, you were saying some uh, amusing things. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for saying I'm funny. Um, but yeah, I, um, crime con was so crazy for me because it was my first time. It was weird because I've never done like a conference like this. So you're in like this hotel conference area and you like, don't leave. Like you could like Orlando crime con could have been like West Virginia or, massachusetts like it doesn't really matter where you are because you never leave but there's also so many people that like i would meet people like you and then i'd never see them again and then i'd meet another person and i'd be like oh i didn't get to have that conversation with them 
but I'll see them in a little bit. And then they're gone into the abyss and you will, I'll never see them again until next crime con, (laughs) which is kind of like summer camp, I guess. Yeah. A little bit, (laughs) a little bit like summer camp, but it's great to see anybody who experiences crime con for the first time, especially someone like yourself with this like incredible story that you have and the incredible podcast that you have. And you're able to go there and talk about that. What was your experience like in that sense? Like I'm now about to talk about this very personal thing. Yeah, it was kind of a whirlwind. I wasn't expecting. I'll tell the story. <laughs> I, it's a very funny anecdote to what I was expecting versus what I got. I thought no one would talk to me just because, like, I'm with people who have been podcasting for years. Like, they're familiar with them. These are fans coming to meet people who they listen to. And I'm very new to this space. So for me, it was more like, oh, I'm going to tell my story. I hope a couple people listen and like, whatever. People were coming up to me who like listened to my podcast. And so that was really weird because that introduction I was expecting to make, I sort of had my elevator pitch ready, was irrelevant because people then already had listened and they already knew a lot about my personal life which was really strange. But I didn't think that many people were going to talk to me so much so that I brought these bags that said, did you kill my dad on them? And a lot of people were really interested in those. But I only brought 50 of them thinking like, and I thought I was going to bring home bags. I was like, oh, I should have just gotten less. I do not want to lug home like more bags. And in like an hour, I had talked to so many people that the bags were gone. So I had to find a place in Orlando to like rush print me 500 more bags and get them to me by like 6 p.m. that day. And they did. That's incredible. That's incredible. And that's not not talking uh, not talking us down a little bit. But if we ever did that, and we ran out of bags. We'd be like, oh, we have no more bags. (laughs) (laughs) I guess that's how it's going to (laughs) be. Most people definitely would. But I, I, I just like was so excited and like desperate to get my story out there. And then, yeah, it was just like, I mean, it's a lot, it's very draining to talk about your life in so many like sort of split, like this is nice. It's like long form, but when you're like, I've got like 35 seconds with this person and then there's another person behind them and another person behind them. It's a lot, but it was really special to meet people. And I think not to downplay what other people do with their podcast. I think it was really special for attendees of CrimeCon to meet someone who had been personally impacted by a story because a lot of them have also been personally impacted by a story. And so I could feel that relief as well. And that that was really, really special. Good. Wow. Well, yeah, glad to hear you had a uh, a good experience at CrimeCon. Um, I, I, I did not get you, to meet you. Uh, I was not at the, uh, the opening night party. So, uh, very nice to meet you. And, uh, I've been listening to your podcast. It's excellent. Um, so congratulations on ice cold case. Can you tell Thank us you. a little bit about it? Sure. So sort of from like the true crime perspective, um, in 2002, my dad was murdered in Belmont County, Ohio, and he was shot in the doorway of his home. In the early morning, it was bright outside, these men just ran away. There really wasn't any sort of lead. There wasn't anything the police were following. And shortly after, it just went cold. And that's sort of the beginning of this wild story. And when I was six, this happened. My family told me that my dad had a heart attack. I had really come to terms with that. And I had peace with that. And when I was 16 is when I found out that my dad was actually murdered. And that's when things took a big turn. And I couldn't stop thinking about this case. As someone who grew up sort of a fan of true crime, it was really wild to be thrown into the middle of a story. And I couldn't stop like hyper fixating on it. And so I started to dive into it, looking into theories and what the police had and people who were around at the time, if they could have had motive. And I started just gathering all of this information. I started talking to my family members and I realized that there was something here, but no one was going to listen 
to like a Facebook post or me calling the police wasn't working. There were just all these things that really weren't moving the needle at all. And so I thought if I could put this into the public space, maybe that pressure or that interest would kind of force people into a corner and either confess what they know or do something about it. And so that's where the podcast sort of came from. And now it's in the world, which is so wild. And all nine episodes of the first installment are out. It's just, it's crazy because I obviously remember these moments when it was nothing, when it wasn't even an idea yet. And it's really surreal that now I'm going to CrimeCon and people are coming up to me saying that they've listened to my podcast. And literally every time someone says it, even you saying it, like my heart melts. Like it's so special to hear that people are listening um, because every single person is helping push this closer and closer to where I wanted it to be. And so it's been a really wild ride. And it's really personal for you too, obviously. Uh, this happened when you were six and you were told one thing, which I was thinking about that when, you know, learning about the details of your father's murder and your life and, and his life even. When you're when you're told that your father had a heart attack, so you've come, you even said it yourself, like you've come to terms with that. Like my, my father died, he died of a heart attack. You've told people this when they asked, you know, where's your father? Uh, and you say, I, he's died of a heart attack. So you, it's not even like one thing that you have to deal with as as a as a young person to wrap your your reality around it's it's this that's bad enough but nope it's actually even worse but you harnessed it in such a way where you were able to put it into this narrative and i'm wondering like what what is your background can you just fill us in on like how did you do this so well and keep it so personal yeah. Um, and that's spot on. Like it was my whole identity. Like when your parent dies of cancer or something like you kind of take that on and maybe you're an advocate for cancer research or you go to the five K's like that becomes sort of this part of you that like helps you connect with your lost loved one. So to find out that like, I was really passionate about like hearts and that was not really part of my story was very weird. But yeah, so my background, I am a TV producer, which helped a lot in the sort of formation and telling of the story, because that's what I do every day for other things like food shows and other things like that. So that helped a lot. But I actually went to school to sort of learn about this side because of this case. So I found out that my dad was murdered at 16 and I was three weeks away, two and a half weeks away from graduating high school. So my life was really at this pivotal moment of like, okay, what do you want to be? Like, who do you want to be in the world? And I knew that I always liked film and television. I made parody music videos with my friends in high school. And I was like, what if I use that to tell my dad's story? And so I went to college and I studied communications because I went to a liberal arts school and they don't really have any specialties at those schools. So I studied a little bit of everything in communications and I found myself turning everything into a video project. I remember having like 10 page papers due and calling my professor being like, can I make a video instead? And so that was always sort of what I was trying to do. Yeah. Then I got really l lucky is the word I use, but I'm sure hard work had something to do with it. Getting my job in TV and learning a ton about story and how to tell a story and how to sort of keep yourself out of it, but also be in it. And all of those skills were really valuable in putting this show together, but it's hard. And I, I see the reviews that it can be a little biased. And my argument to that is like, how could it not be? But I do think I do a really good job of keeping it as unbiased as possible given the context of the story. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, it's a, it's a great listen and um and yeah, you've lived you've experienced uh something different than if, you know, this was uh even done by an investigator on the case or or something like that. It's it's a obviously a much more personal story. Can you tell us a bit about your dad? Who was he? What was he like? Yeah, my dad, what a layered, colored character. So to me, my dad was like a pretty typical, like 
protective dad. My sister was, she's nine years older than me. So she was like 15, 14, 15 for like the moments I remember. And my dad was so strict with her. And I think that's because he grew up like in a really rough area. He had a lot of siblings that he sort of had to step in to help take care of. And he didn't want my sister to ever have to struggle. So he didn't want her to make the wrong decisions and, you know, party in high school and sort of go down this path. So he was really strict with her. And I just remember them fighting about she always wanted to go to sleepovers or she wanted to go to like prom or whatever. And my dad being so like anxious and protective of her. So like pretty standard, like dad, we spent a lot of time together. He was kind of funny. I always think about like movies where like the dad is doing like treating the youngest kid like they're way older than they are and like talking to them about things that like they shouldn't be talking about. Like I probably knew every word to the Nelly album at like five and a half years old. Like it's just like, and we're like singing it in the car, like very inappropriate, but like kind of funny and like a comedic way. And so like that, that's how I remember my dad. Um, and so, yeah. And then learning about sort of this other side of him, um, which is, you know, he was a complex person like we all are, and we all sort of have these different sides to us. And he was a former drug dealer. He was a police informant. He was a drug addict, a recovering drug addict. That's how he met my mom. They met at Narcotics Anonymous, you know, these very, very layered, but what I remember versus what I learned about my dad are very different. I didn't expect you to go down uh, the the silence is because I didn't expect you to go down the uh, the layered part with the the drug dealing. It, you say it so like casually, which is impressive because obviously you've come to terms with that. Uh, can you just elaborate a little bit more on that because it's a really riveting part of the story? Yeah, um, and maybe it's because I as I learn more about this story, my empathy really grows for people who are fighting to survive. And there's so many sides to these stories where, you know, a drug dealer can sell drugs to someone who then overdoses and dies. And then, you know, that's a difficult situation to navigate. But also if this drug dealer is selling drugs so they can put food on the table for their family, it's like all of these situations are so complicated and there isn't really a black and white to it that my empathy has really started to grow for this because it it's easy to just be like drug dealing is bad period but none of this is black and white and there's so much in this gray area that exists that makes these stories so difficult but yes my dad was a drug dealer at one point i'm more thinking as early as like 15 16 until probably around like 35 to 38 and maybe even dabbling after that, but he became a confidential informant right around then. So I'm assuming that that's when he like stopped. And if he was doing it, it was because of his like job. Crack cocaine was like massive at the time. Um, And so that was probably what he was dealing most. And that was really at the height of this like really weird drug landscape in America. And I mean, it's weird now, but in a different way. And so he was addicted to drugs, but also selling drugs. It's just like, it's really sad what happens to people when they feel like they have no other option and society doesn't really help them have any other options. But yeah, that's part of my dad's story. And then he turned CI to get himself out of trouble. And I think that's also a really interesting part of our legal system, our justice system, our police system is um, how they use people for their advantage to either get a bigger guy and sort of cut a deal with a smaller guy. But then now my dad is sort of tied to the police and his back is up against a wall. And then sort of the same reasons that he turned to drug dealing would be the same reasons why he has to stay an informant because he wants to protect his family and himself. And it's, it's very complicated. And again, I think even in those communities, they're like, oh, if you're a snitch, like that's bad. But there's this gray area of like, well, why is this happening? You know, if you've got kids at home and they don't have another parent, you don't want them to go into the foster system. There's just so much at play. Yeah. And um, tell us why you chose podcasting as the medium to, to help you tell this story, um, especially with your, with your TV background. I'm wondering what benefits podcasts offer that um, other mediums might not. 
in the beginning, I thought podcasting offered no benefits. Um, I was very against making a podcast. I am a TV producer. Like, I'm not a podcaster. And I had never done it before. Like, I didn't know about any of this. I didn't know the world. I didn't know the back end. It was very, as complicated as TV production is. Making a podcast from scratch can feel really daunting because it's like, what do I need to do? So originally, this was supposed to be a documentary. I tried very hard to get my family to talk on camera. I could barely get them to talk on a microphone. So documentary sort of seemed out of the question because a lot of people were afraid for their life. They were afraid for their own safety, their family safety. And some people just weren't interested in talking to me at all for reasons that they didn't dive into. So it just made sense to either mic them or if they weren't comfortable with that, can I put my phone here? It just sort of was this natural progression into podcasting. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I did a podcast. So it's funny how the moment I put out the podcast, I was like, I'm really glad that this was the the medium that I used. So, And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. And do you mind taking us through what you know of your father's murder? Yeah. So I know he was murdered, but... I know that he was shot in the doorway of his home. So there was something going on outside. So there, you walk up the steps and there's the front door. There was something happening either on the steps or on the way up to the steps that I believe would have gotten my dad out of bed, which was on this top floor by the front door. There was a window here. So he would have heard what was going on. He got out of bed. He was walking towards the front door when the front door was kicked in. And he was shot, one kill shot to the head, fell to the ground. And that's what's so interesting is he never, he never made it to the door. And the people that were there never entered the house. So they shot my dad and then immediately left. And so that's also pretty strange. There was a shoe print on the door from where it was kicked in, a size 10 shoe. So that's also kind of interesting. And there was just like, just from where it was kicked. Um, I actually, very strangely, got a message from the person who lives in that house now, my dad's old house, and they said that every so often they still have to repatch the drywall from where the door handle was kicked into the door. And so they just like every few years have to like repatch that hole, which is really interesting. So those are sort of the details of like what logistically happened there. Um, There was a home invasion next door at my dad's sister's house. Her name is Pearl. And her son Omar was home at the time and his girlfriend Kim. And at around six in the morning, three or four men broke into their house and were there for about 30 to 35 minutes. That seems like a long time for a home invasion, especially if it's like a robbery. They're trying to get money, get in, get out. And then those are the same men that allegedly went over next door. But it's weird that they would go into one house and spend 30 minutes looking for money and then go to the other house and never even enter the home. So it does seem like this was planned and um, my dad was a target. But as far as like being able to prove that, I haven't gotten there yet, but these are sort of like the facts mixed in with my theory and how I'm trying to move forward to see if I'm onto something. Okay. So how do you as a television producer approach this and on a couple different, I guess, factors here that would come into play? It's a, it's a tremendous story to tell regardless of whether or not this is your father, uh, regardless whether or not you're related to the person. So how do you approach that? Because there's the personal side, there's the story side, and there's also the danger side, you know? And then all of that information you have to process in order to tell this properly. And I know you said you read a review where someone said you're biased, but I mean, come on, like how can, like, how would you in, in any universe not be a little bit biased? And also don't write that review stop like that's annoying that you're taking the time out of your day to write that but um i'm 
making this into a way longer question than it has to be. What was your approach? That's a really good question. And I think for a while I had no idea. Um, but I started with really my journey, my personal side, and I sort of let the story kind of tell itself. And I think in the beginning, that's sort of, that was where my head was at was, Let's tell the story in the order that I learned things. Let's tell the story in the way that I did it so that the audience can process the information the exact same way that I processed the information versus going back and like piecemealing it and putting it together. And so that's kind of what I did. So like episode one starts with the police file and the story according to the records, which is what I saw first. Then we dive into how I found out about my dad's murder and like that my personal story. And then we go into the the different people that could have been involved. And I learned about them in the order that I tell them. And then we go into like kind of putting it together, the police, all of these things. So you're kind of going through it in the way that I process the information, which is the personal side. And so that was the one piece. Now, the storytelling piece was, of course, this has to tell a story and it has to be compelling enough for people to listen. So how do we do that? So we utilize, you know, cliffhangers, shorter episodes, like there were things in the format that we were able to do so that the story could really maintain its integrity, but we could make it something like sound effects and all of those things could really help. So that was something that was really important to me. And as a producer who takes a lot of pride in her work, but had never done a podcast, I was very adamant that this had to be good. And that took a lot of time because I had never done this before. So figuring out, you know, where should sound effects go? Do we add in music here? I had to hire a composer for our opening and outro music. Like there was just a lot of stuff that I was not expecting that really drove the story in such a good way that I am glad I took the time to do those things. But in the moment I was like, is this even necessary? But then once you hear the final product, you're like, yeah, that really helped. But I think, yeah, trying to tell this story that didn't feel so personal, it was isolating, but felt personal enough that you wanted to like learn more about it. And I think that writing that line was really important and difficult at times, but there were moments like I wrote three or four versions of episode three before we recorded it because it was hard to like really get it right, but it was really important that we did. And so, yeah, it was very important to maintain integrity, but tell a good story. I'm curious about the uh, 911 calls that are included. Were were those real calls or were they FOIAs and, and you recreated via the transcripts? Yeah, they are recreated via transcript. So unfortunately, they do not have the 911 calls anymore due to it being so long ago. But I'd be interested if even four months later, if they still have those 911 calls. So I did have the transcripts. And so, yeah, they were re-recorded. We actually, I'm not pro AI, but we were able to take voice recordings from the people talking and put them through an AI program. And that's what was talking. So it's as close to the real thing as possible. Sounds like you're pro AI. (laughs) I am... Pro AI as a tool, not a replacement. Oh, well, well said. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I want to circle back on, uh, you said episode three, you wrote uh, a few times before you got to write. And this is the episode that's titled An Illegal Adoption Gone Wrong. Yeah. Without getting, you know, giving away too much. Uh, why was that so difficult to write? Oh my gosh, so many reasons. Um, it's such a difficult and like, heart-wrenching story that is very personal to me because it has to do with my brother who I've still never met in person. And so to tell sort of his his story that maybe or maybe he doesn't know a lot about, um, it, it was hard to, to tell. Um, I also wanted to get the details right. I wanted to be sensitive to the communities involved. Um, I didn't want to put shame on anyone, but I wanted to tell this story because I think it's vitally important to the case. I also rewrote it. One one of the times I rewrote it because I've been like processing this information for years. And the first time I listened, we recorded the whole episode and I listened and I was like, oh my gosh, I wrote this as if I'm talking to someone who already knows everything. 
And so I had like, I didn't have enough detail. Like if you had listened to that version, you would be like, wait, who is, what is happening here? Like I need a visual because it was hard to follow. Cause when I listen back, I try to listen as someone who doesn't know anything. And I realized like, oh my gosh, this is way too complicated. And I didn't give enough detail. So I had to go back in and I was just going to add in sections. And then I realized like, I have to rewrite the whole thing. And this was the last round. So we had already rewritten it a few times. And the, the episode was coming out in like four days. And I had to rewrite the whole thing, record it, send it off to be mixed all at the last minute. It was very <laughs> difficult and stressful. But it was, yeah, it was, that one is tough. Yeah, you mentioned how uh, stressful putting this podcast together can be. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, effects of that stress? Yeah, so many effects. So... I'll give like a funnier example before I get into the gross one. I got a massage last week for the first time in like forever. My like massage therapist was like so shocked by how knotted up my shoulder was that he like couldn't believe it. Like kept asking me like what I did for a living. And so that made me feel bad and it was really stressful. And then I had to go back again because like stress just builds up like everywhere. But also I have this thing called burning mouth syndrome where my lips, like all the stress, like targets to my lips. And it feels almost like a mix of like, I have a sunburn and I have like sandpaper rubbing up against my lips at all times. And the only thing that can help is like chapstick and like not being so stressed, which is impossible. So I just live with it now. I've only had it for like a couple months, but like, it's not fun. But it's been like, yeah, it's been stressful. I've, I've found myself really just feeling overwhelmed sometimes and like zoning out. I've been really forgetful. I've been dropping a lot of balls in like work and personal life because this is like, I mean, you know, making a podcast is hard, period. It's just a lot of work. You have to, you know keep a lot of things top of mind but when it's something that's so personal I feel like I never check out like I never clock out of work I'm always working people are always wanting to talk about this as more and more press comes out people want to talk about that and it's wonderful and I'm so beyond grateful but there are moments I just need a break and I don't feel like I'm able to get that and I think that's where all the stress sort of builds up um and then it never goes away so then it just keeps building Yeah. And it's like almost as if you would start to feel guilty, I suppose, if you do like allow yourself to take a break. So you really do have to. I mean, we're not, I think Tim and I are uh, honorary psychiatrists and psychologists and criminologists and all of those things. We're not officially, we don't have degrees, but we've heard enough from professionals to know it's okay. You know, it's okay to just take a break from like the stress and the pain, uh, that, that comes with it. And I don't know, are you there yet? Um, I feel like I have my day. I like, yes and no. I have days where it's so, I don't know. I guess for me, it's like, it all hits me at once. And then I, I'm good and I can, I can go for a while and everything is easier to disassociate and push through and kind of keep that end goal in mind. And it it feels a little bit more like a job sometimes where like, I'm clocking into work, I'm going to work, I'm doing this thing and I just keep going. And then I think some days it's like, it hits me, oh, this is crazy. Like, this is insane. And this is so much. And then I just like become a mess. So I don't know if I'm really at a place where I'm like (laughs) totally at terms with all of this stuff. I was talking to someone yesterday and they were like, you know, this is like kind of your life now. Like this is what you do. And I was like, yeah, but this was already my life. I just didn't do this before. So like it was already, all of this was already my life. I just wasn't so public and it wasn't so, um, out in the world but now it is and I just kind of have to like deal with it 
Yeah, I feel like you'd be in a worse position if you didn't put it out to the world. I feel like that's like the story inside of you that you really want to tell, but you're not allowing yourself to tell. And the stress that that would cause would probably be like 10 times worse. Yeah, 100%. And I actually think that you're spot on. And I, I noticed that there was a release in some ways when I did put out the show. There was more stress than others, but I did feel like this this lightness for a moment when I started to put out these episodes of just knowing that like I did something to move the needle. I did something to impact this case. And that's all I can do. I've done everything that I can do now. And that feels really good, but it is, you know, it's a lot. And I think that it will get better. Um, There's a lot shifting. I think it's tough when I'm working full time, trying to do this full time, trying to promote it full time. It's like I have a bunch of jobs, but I'm hoping that things will shift soon where I can really focus a lot more time on this case and investigating. And if that's the case, I think that'll alleviate a lot of stress. So what else was available via FOIA and what are your feelings on the official investigation uh, that was done? Um, funny you would ask. I never filed a Freedom of Information Act oh. um, because this case is not federal. And Ohio does not... Rec- they have like a um, public records request, which is what I filed. However, they are not required, nor do they have to give me anything at all. So I called the Belmont County Sheriff's Department to ask for the files. They said that they would send them over in a couple weeks. I never got them. I followed up. I cited the Freedom of Information Act. They said, well, we're not federal and we don't abide by the Freedom of Information Act. And if we don't want to send them to you, we don't have to. She said she would follow up. I never got them. About six months later, I called the Belmont County Prosecutor's Office and asked them if I could have the files. And a couple weeks later, I got them. So David Liberati and Kevin Flanagan at their office basically said that they sort of filed this public records request for me because I had called them. And because I was a family member, they were willing to give me a little bit of stuff. So I got a redacted police file. It's a very small file especially for a murder investigation. For example, the probate records, which is what happens to someone's estate when they die. My dad's probate records are like four times the size of the police file that investigated his murder. So I would say that it was lackluster at best. And they did not collect a lot of evidence that I'm aware of. Um, I haven't seen a list of evidence, so I'm not sure, but I would imagine that that'd be something they'd be willing to give me when I'm getting the police files and I haven't seen it. Um, They say that they have things, but they've never tested anything for DNA. Um, So I, my family was going in and out of the house after, right after my dad was murdered. So they didn't really tape it off. They allowed people to go in and out. There's just a lot of things that like, just from my limited knowledge of watching like SVU, I'm like, oh, you just don't do that. You just don't do that. And why did they allow this to happen? And why didn't they do X, Y, and Z? Isn't this protocol? And are these questions that you're presenting, obviously in the podcast, but are you presenting it to the investigators as well and getting those answers or getting an answer? (laughs) Yeah, I am. So the first time I met with Detective Duvall at the Belmont County Prosecutor's Office, I um, didn't know a lot at the time. So it was more just like, let's get to know each other. I want to talk to you about what I read in the files, etc. I met up then with the uh, Belmont County Prosecutor's Office and I grilled them a little bit more because I was a little bit more comfortable. They were the second people I talked to versus the first. And then I sent them a pretty comprehensive email following up listing out every question I had. I never got a reply to that email, but it had all of these questions in it. Um, What happens if the police don't really do their job? Who holds them accountable? What happens if a murder can't be solved because the police didn't do things that they know they should do? Are they complicit? Like we have accomplices all the time for people who assist in people getting away with murder. Would the police also be assisting and someone getting away with murder if they don't do their job. So there's a lot of questions I had 
that I didn't get any answers to, but hopefully I will soon. I mean, I sent that email like a year and a half ago, but yeah, I did present all of these questions and I've since tried to get a hold of these offices to talk to them and I haven't been able to. Um, and now that the podcast is out, I probably won't ever. <laughs> and this was, you said, the first installment. And I enjoyed that you used the word installment and not uh, seasons because it feels to me like more official, I guess, uh, when you say when you say installments and you're treating it uh, in, an, in that capacity. Uh, you just wrapped up um, the final episode of this first installment last month, right, in September. How far along is the second installment? It's coming along. Um, there's been some really, really exciting developments on the production side that have me really, it, just really pumped for what could possibly be with this next um, part of the show. And I'm hopeful that it helps the case in a big way. So it's coming along really well. I'm getting a lot of good leads. I'm setting up some things and people that I really want to talk to to get more information and learn the intricacies of this case a little bit deeper and the people involved a little bit more. So that will be really helpful, I think, in my understanding of what really could have happened and who could have been there. So that, I think, will put me down a really solid path to having a really concrete idea of what happened. So it's really coming along. Um, part two, yes, it's going to be just the same season just because this case is, you know, all the same. So we'll just drop another installment of episodes um, in the beginning-ish of 2024. So sometime between January and March, depending on how quickly I can get these interviews done and kind of move things along. But definitely by March, um, there will be more episodes. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. Have you been able to identify or, or do you have knowledge of the people who were involved in the home invasion um, before your father was killed? I have a really strong idea of who was there. And so a lot of this next part of the show will be me trying to prove if I'm correct. So, um, just trying to reach out to the people themselves, their family. I have contact info for partners at the time and just really trying to figure out where they were, where they could have possibly been. Um, and if it logically makes sense that they were there, on, like at the scene. Are you in any way concerned about your own safety? Um, I am. I wouldn't say I'm scared. I'm cautious for sure. Um, I've taken a lot of things into consideration and taken a, a few extra steps that I maybe wouldn't have in the past. Um, I got rid of like my air tags and my location services are off on my phone and like doing a few things. Like I added an extra lock to my door. I've been really cautious lately and I, I do sort of feel like I'm always looking over my shoulder, but if anyone tries to do anything to me, then they're obviously guilty. So I think it would be a bad look for them, if you ask me. Yeah, and and I uh, read here that there was a threatening message on your Facebook page. You should stop or I'll make you stop. Yeah, I've had a few of those. Um, and they're almost always from my family member. <laughs> um, so I've gotten Facebook messages, YouTube comments, text messages, voice memos from several family members that are not happy about this podcast are not happy about my investigation. They would just prefer me to like sit down, shut up and move on with my life. And I would prefer that as well, but I unfortunately cannot do that. Um, so it's been really weird, but also enlightening because if you're so worried about this, what are you trying to hide? That's a great point. And I'm just impressed that you, uh handle all of these things and you still maintain a really positive point of view and also the sense of humor that comes along with what you're doing. And I'm, I'm referencing the bags that you mentioned at CrimeCon. What did the bags say? The bags um, say, did you kill my dad? And that was definitely um, a way for me to get the story out there 
an eye grabbing sort of marketing ploy to help people like sort of stop and stare. What is that? What's that about? Check out the show. Maybe they have a friend in Ohio or yada, yada. But I, I really, I love Taylor Swift and I think she's a remarkable marketer. And so I really wanted to like be the Taylor Swift of podcasting. And so I, everything I do, I think about sort of how to make a big splash that's super strategic and makes sense, but is also sensitive in a way, but also funny because that's sort of my personality. And I guess knowing what you uh, know about your father, do you think that he would appreciate the sense of humor that comes along with that? 100%. Um, I think he would want a bag. <laughs> I know Tim's dying to make a uh, Lance's the Taylor Swift of podcasting joke right now. Oh no, I was I was gonna make a, a Travis Kelsey uh, comparison actually. Oh okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so you called yourself Batman, or you kind of kind of compared yourself to Batman uh, in one of the episodes. Um, can you tell tell us a little bit uh, about that? Yeah. I love, 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 love Christopher Nolan. Um, and I love his Batman trilogy. They're my favorite movies. And I watch them all the time. And I get really inspired every time I watch because the story is just so, I don't know, inspiring to me and and really interesting, just his path in life. And I think that I unknowingly always resonated with that story because he lost his parents and this thing that happened to him as a child just like really impacted the rest of his life and sort of shaped where he ended up going. And then he ends up, you know, fighting for justice and working with the police, but also not with the police and um, trying to take down this like kind of mob bad guy scenario. And the complexities and the morals of is what he is doing right? Is it wrong? Is it hurting other people? Is he exploiting other people for his own interests? There's all of this stuff at play that I resonate with. And I had always felt that in my soul, but I had never really thought about it until I was sitting with a friend who I was talking about the story with. And, and he said, oh, you're kind of like Batman. And as soon as I heard that, it was like I embodied that. And I was like, I'm Batman. Like, I am. And I just ran with that. And it, the more I thought about it, the more it became true. And almost every time I watch the movies, I'm like, oh, wow, there's another similarity we have. Or, oh, there's this other thing that we have in common. And so it's, it's just really funny. And I really get inspired when I watch those movies by just the tenacity of the character and how it's it's never really enough and um i i resonate with that as well because i'm at a point where i just feel like will it ever be enough i just have to keep going i think that's really cool but if we meet you again at crime con next year and you're dressed like batman i'll be a little concerned i mean listen people dress up for comic con that's true no costumes at crime con yeah i do wear all black so I feel like in a way I that is my my uniform. So are you going to CrimeCon next year? I would love to go to CrimeCon next year. So yeah, if I'm allowed and invited, then I will be there. And what do you uh tell people if they have information on your father's murder? Is there a call to action? Yes. So you can email um icecoldcasepodcast at gmail.com with any sort of tips. I'm investigating literally all of them and then sending over the ones that have legs to the police department and um, crossing my fingers. But now um, I'm really going to start pushing for calling the police department directly as well, just so that they know that people want this case solved and maybe that will help. So they're the Belmont County Sheriff's Department in Belmont County, Ohio.